Good morning, everyone. Just want to welcome you to our special part three uh, service on talking points. And for the, the last two weeks, we've been really leaning in to this whole idea of, you know, what is the church's position when it comes to, you know, politics, when it comes to the election? And, uh, you know, today we're going to wrap up this series because I believe it's so important for us to be prepared and actually lean into what's going on in our society and make sure that the church maintains its focus and its position uh, that Jesus intended. Uh, and if you ever wonder, where are we and what's going on, you can always go back to the scriptures. You can always go back to the early history of the church to see how our early brothers and sisters responded. And it is a clear vision as to how we need to conduct ourselves as God's church. I really want to thank uh, Anthony and Mike who've uh, done the lessons the last couple of weeks. And so today we're going to be doing part three of Talking Points. What's the role of the church in politics? And I just want to assure you, we're not going to be talking about necessarily politics today. We're going to be talking about Jesus. We're going to be talking about the early church and how they responded to social pressure, how they responded to tension that was happening in our society, in their society, which is technically our society right now, and how we need to respond. So before we get started, I want to just lead you in a word of prayer. So pray with me now that God can speak to each one of us. Pray. Father, we love you. We thank you today that uh, we can study your word. Thank you that uh, your word is preserved for us. God, that we don't have to wonder uh, what your will is. We don't have to wonder how to respond, how to live our lives here. It's very clear. Uh, Father, thank you even that our brothers and sisters in the early church, they didn't have the written word, yet they had your Holy Spirit and were led by your Spirit and they were led by humility. And God, we just pray that today your Spirit will guide us and guide me. I pray, Father, you'll speak through me today to help our church. Father, navigate uh, what we are going through as a society. It's a lot, God. We've been going through a lot for these last seven months. And we just pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you'll fill us with your Spirit, give us the strength, and give us the heart and the faith so we can continue and persevere and be a light in our society. God, thank you so much for Jesus, for what he did for us on the cross. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. You know, I wanted to start out this lesson today by, by sharing with you why I decided to follow Jesus. One of the reasons. And one of the reasons that I decided to follow Jesus when I was 21 years old is because my life was coming, becoming unraveled uh, on so many levels. And I realized that I had been following and being, I was influenced by the world's narrative and it was, it was ripping my life apart. Uh, and, and this was the reason I decided to follow Jesus, because I said, man, the world, the world is leading me in the completely wrong direction. I mean, my life was characterized by, by greed, by selfishness, by lust, by immorality, by worldly desires, idolatry. There were so many things that were coming undone in my life, and I realized I can't continue to live this way if I'm going to realize some of my heart dreams. And the biggest thing is I realized that I was separated from God because of my behavior and because of the way I was living my life. But I realized, man, I'm just following the influence of this world. See, because everybody else was doing it. I was 21 years old, living on a college campus, and I was doing it just like everybody else, the vast majority. It was society's narrative, and they were influencing my decisions, my values. And the consequence? I was coming undone. And, and, and the truth is, at 21, I was tired. I said, I don't want to do this anymore. And I, I hit the pause button and I, I went to my sister's house and I said, listen, I see something different in you. I see the way that, that your marriage is working and your family's working and I see a peace about you. And I asked her when I went to her house, I said, I want to study the Bible. 
and not just study the Bible. I want to study the Bible every day until I get my life right. Because, see, I was already decided. Enough. I'm not going to follow the, the influence of the world anymore. I'd had enough. I'd seen enough. I'd experienced enough. And I said, no mas. And so that was the beginning of my journey in February of 1985. But it was real clear to me why I was where I was and what was the way to get out of it. You say, well, what does that have to do with this, this whole series and this, this lesson on you know, the church and politics? It has everything to do with it. Because you and I decided to follow Jesus. We decided to separate ourselves from the world and no longer follow the influence of the world. We decided to follow Jesus and say, Jesus, you're the one who's going to lead our decision making. You're going to lead our values. And see, here's where it gets complicated. When we start to blend in with some of those values of the world. So let's look at a couple of passages. And this is kind of the, the frame of, of what was going on in my life and, and the world's ver narrative versus, you know, my new change that I experienced at 21 years of age. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Just to put this in context, virtually every one of these sins that Paul lists out in Galatians was in my life. And it was tearing my life apart. I had this huge hole in my soul. And I, I was tired. I was done. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Talk about stating the obvious. I knew I wasn't going to go to heaven with my lifestyle. But not just that. What was, what was clear to me, my life is a mess. And if I'm going to get right with God, and I'm going to, if I'm going to make it, you know, in, in any area of my life, in relationships, in a career, in anything, I've got to follow another narrative. I've got to follow God's narrative Jesus' narrative. And that's why I went to my sister's house and I said, listen, show me. Teach me. I know you know the Bible because I can see it in your life. Show me how God has influenced you to change and be who you are. And then, then look at this passage. You know, and I made the decision when I started to study the Bible, Jesus will now be the greatest influence in my life. Not the world, not my friends, not the news media, not all these other... these." you know, uh, sources of influence. No, no. Jesus is going to be my primary influence from now on. And look at what happened. Paul goes on in verse 22 and he says this, But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here's what I needed probably the most, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. And this is the contrast that came into my life. You know, when I started studying the Bible, I started making changes. But the big change came was a week and a half after I started to study. I finished my studies and I said, now, okay, so what's next? And then my brother-in-law, he showed me Acts chapter 2. You need to repent, which I had. And you need to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you need to get baptized in the name of Jesus. And I said, when can I do it? Let's go. And so it was on a Thursday night with just a small group of people and an ice cold swimming pool that I decided to follow Jesus and change my life. And after that day, everything started changing. The scales fell from my eyes. And I started to realize, now I can live differently. You know, it wasn't very uh, far after that. A few months later, I, I made a phone call to my father, my dad, my, 
uh, earthly father and I said, hey, you know, we got to get together. Can, can I drive? Uh, and I lived about two hours away from home. And so I said, can I drive home and can we have, can we have uh, a, a meal together? I, I got some things I got to share with you. Because see, our relationship was on the rocks. And I felt a lot of animosity and a lot of bitterness towards my dad because of his absence. And, you know, when I came to Christ, I realized, man, I got I to gotta own my sin. And my sin was bitterness, anger, and resentment. And I confessed it to him. And I said, I, Dad, I just want to say I'm sorry. And I, I want to start fresh. Will you forgive me for my bitterness? And I realized that my dad had done his best to provide for me. And he didn't give me what I wanted, but he gave me what he knew best to do. So it changed everything. From that day on, our relationship changed and is still uh, an incredible relationship that I'm so thankful for. But it all came back because of Jesus' influence on my life. It changed everything. It changed the way I looked and treated women. It changed and looked at how I treated my classmates. Uh, everybody. It changed my worldview. It changed uh, my career ambitions. It was no longer about, well, I'm going to go and, and finish my, my business degree. Oh, yeah, I did that, but that wasn't what I was after. Now I was after I want to be in the ministry and I want to be a missionary for Jesus. And I, I mentioned this because I realized, you know, guys, we got to stop and ask ourselves at different stages in our life, who is influencing us? I want to teach you a, a, a word, uh, and, and, and before we go there, I, I want to just, Paul finishes out verse 24 and 25 of Galatians 5. He finishes the chapter, and he says this, Those who belong to Christ, Christ Jesus, have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Okay, so now that you've changed... Be careful. Be careful to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Be careful to stay on the same path where the Holy Spirit and God's Word are the, the primary influences in your life, not other things. Because see, here's something that I realized living on a college campus at 21 years old in a co-ed dormitory. You're one step away from letting things influence you again to go back to the life that you had before. And so, you know, Paul is reminding us, stay in step with the Spirit, because if you don't, you can become conceited, you can get puffed up, you can, you can begin provoking and envying each other. There can be divisions among you if you're not careful. If Jesus isn't your primary influence, guess what can happen in the body of Christ? There can be division over all kinds of things, even politics. And so you and I, I, I believe today, have to ask ourselves, and I really want to encourage you to do an evaluation, because I'm doing my own evaluation. Who is my primary influence? And what are my primary sources of influence? What am I spending my time listening to and allowing into my mind and my heart that's, that's affecting my emotions, that's affecting my decisions? I want to teach you that word that I talked about. It's a word that was coined or a phrase that was coined by Lee Ross. He was a social, uh, he was a so social psychologist. And he came up with this, this, this phrase called the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error. And essentially what it means is, is we attribute people's behavior to their character. But with ourselves, we attribute our behavior to environmental factors. Let me give you an example. You know, you see this guy at work, right? Comes into work. He's late. And, and when you see him late, you go, okay, so here he is. He's late. He's lazy. He is disorganized. And, you know, the guy is just a mess. Okay? And, and, and that's how you characterize him. But let me change it around for you. You're late. What's your reason for being late? Well, no, I'm not. I'm not lazy. In fact, what happened with me being late is uh, the, the fact that I, 
I was uh, getting the kids ready for school. And then somebody called me, a friend called me and, and needed some help. So what I did was I, I took time out. See, see, I'm not lazy. I'm, in fact, I'm so busy, that's why I'm late. And I care so much about people, that's why I'm late. You see how it's twisted? And we lay judgment on people because of what we think is wrong with them. And see, that's a fundamental attribution error. It's a, it's a flip-sided narrative that I'm going to judge you based on what I see in your character. I'm going I'm to tie. But with me, it's all about environmental circumstances. That is the reason for my behavior. See, that's twisted. And guess what? In the arena of politics, that is exactly what people do. You know, they choose sides with, with, with politics, and, and they frame the parties in the same way. Well, see, look at the Democrats. The Democrats are, they're corrupt, and, and you know, they're socialist, and, you know, they've got all these different viewpoints that they change all the time. And the Republicans, oh my gosh, the Republicans, they are greedy, and they're racist, and they are heartless. And see, no matter what perspective you're on, you look at these two groups and it's like, you know, I'm going to put the, the attribution on them. And really what it is, it's cognitive biased. And it's twisted. See, because when you say, take on one side, well, of course, I'm on this side. Of course, we're not that. And if you're on the other side, of course, we're not that. See, because... Our environmental circumstances have created who we are, but you, your character, you are flawed to the core. Stop and think about that. That's what's happening in our society. Is that what Jesus came to teach us to think and how to treat people? Paul said it like this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. He said, carry each other's burdens and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. See, what is the law of Christ? How I, how I treat people. See, when you carry each other's burdens, you have to listen. You have to learn. And you have to lean in. Who is my brother? And what is their situation? Let me, let me connect with them. And in this way, we fulfill the law of Christ. See, this is what our brothers and sisters did in the first century. This is the, the heart and the narrative. They, they looked at this and they said, you know what? What's more important is that we are unified by the influence of Christ and that we learn to carry each other's burdens. And if you would do your own study of how the first century Christians lived, you can look in the book of Acts, but I would encourage you to look at the second century Christians and how they lived their lives. Do you realize that people died for their following of Jesus? They were willing to lay down their lives? And when the, the society pressed in on them and then tried to intimidate them, tried to get them to stop letting Jesus be their primary influence and threaten them with death, they said, no. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord, and if you kill me, so be it. And that's what happened in the second century. That's what happened in the first century to some of the apostles. See, the stakes are high. And we've got to ask ourselves today, are we fulfilling the law of Christ? Or are we falling into this trap of the fundamental attribution error by judging people and putting them in these categories that we wouldn't even fit for ourselves? You see, this is completely, and this is what the narrative, when you put this out there on the airwaves with, with these pundits and how they're, they're trying to influence our country, this is exactly what goes on. If you and I listen long enough, this can be our way of thinking. And it can influence the church. And can I just be honest? It is influencing the church. And I don't spend much time on social media, but I have my sources. 
And some of us, you, you've got to be conscience stricken about how the worldly narrative, and you will, well, no, and I have every reason to believe what I believe. Careful. Think about our brothers and sisters in the first century church, and we're going to take a little brief look at it. See, when you do what Paul said, and you carry each other's burdens, and you listen, and you learn, and you lean in, what divides us diminishes. And what unites us surfaces. It's brought up. It's elevated. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you look around in the church, some of us, there's no way that we should ever be united about anything together. Because we're as different as you can, you can possibly imagine it. Yet here we are, brother and sister, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's amazing. It's amazed me for 35 years. Some of the people that I am in fellowship with and some, who, some of the people who are my best friends. And that's what the cross has done. And so here's the real big question. Are we willing to put our faith filter ahead of our political filter? See, and this is what happened in my transformation when I became a disciple. Everything changed. See, because my faith filter was how I viewed the world, how I viewed women, how I viewed politics, how I viewed the, the, the society that surrounded me. It wasn't about who's popular and who's not. It's about who's lost and who's saved. And then, you know, my political filter kind of was diminished. See, because Jesus changed everything for me. And I want to ask you, has your po political filter taken precedent over your faith filter? You know, that's dangerous. But this is normal in a lot of churches in our country right now. They pick a side and they choose a Sunday, which they're going to have a senator or a congressman, and he's going to come in and he's going to be their guest speaker. This is so common in churches in the United States. And they take Jesus' words and they politicize them. They say, well, we're on, the, we're on the right side of Jesus. Really? Are you sure about that? And, and we need to be remi reminded of the fact that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And here's the deal. When we, when we uh, you know, bring Jesus and politicize His Word and, think, and make us think that you know, we're part more like Jesus and we use the Bible as our political platform, we do the world a huge disfavor when we wrap our political ideologies with the teachings of Jesus. Because basically we exclude a huge group of people. And we want to use the Bible for that? You know, it is so twisted. And that's why our church... We will not choose a side because the first century church did not choose a side. They stood with Jesus. And we can't legitimize our standing with a political party because of what the Bible says. You see, because then, what are you saying to everybody else? And we want the church to be a place where all people can come to follow and learn about Jesus. But the moment... You politicize Jesus, you exclude people. And, and that is a spiritual crime. And we got to make sure that we don't fall into that trap as the church. And, 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 and we, we learn to, to, to understand in the first century, Jesus was the king. Caesar was not the king. And he didn't come to rearrange the furniture. He came, as we learned last week, He came to completely take over. He changed, He took the world's view of things and turned it on its head. And we're going to look at some passages that describe that. And it was a complete reverse. And, and we got to ask ourselves, look at what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, where he says this, he says, There's neither Jew nor nor Gentile. I want to put this in perspective for you. Just this first part of the verse. Do you know how hard it was for the Jews to accept Gentiles in the church? Do you, do you realize the mindset that it was to look across the aisle and say, these people are 
spiritually dirty, physically dirty, morally dirty, and I'm supposed to be unified with that? I'm supposed to be unified with these people? He, Jesus wants me to be united with them? And then the Gentiles look at the Jews. You guys have been excluding us forever. You think you're the best. You think you're God's people and we've been pushed out. And you look at us like dogs. Am I supposed to be unified with that? Got to understand, guys, it was so, it was so counterculture. These verses, much, much more extreme than what we deal with here and now. And then he goes on in the second, the second line of this verse, he says, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. You know, and I, I want to put this in perspective because, you know, as we know slavery, it's all about skin color. But in the first century, it wasn't about skin color. It was about you got into debt and you had to sign over your daughter or your son or somebody in your family to pay off the debt. It was basically, if you got in trouble financially, you had to come up with someone, not something, someone. And slavery wasn't about the color of your skin. Slavery was about economy. People were treated like commodity. And Paul's saying, listen, that's over. All that is over. In fact, you're to treat people that have turned themselves over to you economically. You're to treat them like your brother and your sister. And those people that have oppressed you, the, the masters, you've got to treat them like Jesus taught you to teach them. I mean, this was so revolutionary. And, and just for our, our, our nation's sake, I, I just found this out this week. I was doing uh, some, some classwork, and we're learning about uh, the history of, of child abuse. Do you know that it hasn't, wasn't that long ago that children were less than animals? In fact, in 19... Or no, 1866, they passed a law in New York about animals that cruelty towards animals was considered illegal. And then it wasn't until 1875 that they passed a law. I mean, think about it. The law about cruelty towards animals came first. But then in 1875, they passed a law in New York that children, it's illegal to be cruel to children. See, because prior to that, children and women were considered commodity of their fathers. And fathers could do whatever they wanted, just like animals. But they changed the law with animals first. You have to be nice, and you have to take care of the animals. And then later they talked about it. I mean, stop and think about that in our own country. I mean... We've come a long way, haven't we? But we still got a ways to go. But think about what Paul was saying in the first century. And if anybody should be a follower of Jesus, it should be women, because Jesus legitimized and treated women as equals for the very first time. And the Christian fellowship treated women and treated everybody regardless of their background. What this verse is saying, everybody is on a level playing field. Everybody's the same, and we need to treat them as sons and daughters of God. Equal. And this is our narrative. This is our influence. So we need to follow this and go back to this mindset as we think about it. And then I love this verse where Jesus Jesus talked to because of what Jesus brought. It was so counterculture what he brought. Look at what was the response of society when they were listening to Jesus' words. Luke 16, verse 16. It says, The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. People were so blown away by this new influence of Jesus, of love, of unity, of, of treating people the way God intended, they were forcing their way in. They couldn't get enough. 
particularly the people who were marginalized, people who were, who were pushed out. And we got to make sure that we don't allow the world's influence to change what we are about, what, what, what Jesus is about, and, and get into this, this whole division of which side is right. Jesus is right, and every other side, as far as the Word is concerned, is way off balance. And we got to get prevy to what is Satan up to in our society and what he's up to even in the church. So how to respond when we're threatened. When you feel, man, what's the world coming to? And I, and I guarantee you this, no matter, in, in, in a week and a half, we're going to have an election. And there's going to be a group of people that are going to go into panic mode. And then there's going to be another group of people that are going to be celebrating in the streets. And there's going to be two different people. And, you know, if you're in that category, I want you to think about, you know, what, what do you do when there's a threat outside in society that could affect the church? And I wanted to read a passage of Scripture. I wanted us to look at you know, a a reminder of how the church responded when things were tense, when things were intimidating, where things were 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 raw. And 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 look in Acts chapter 12. And this is one example. Uh, Next week we're going to look at some more examples because I have a plan for what we need to do the weekend before election day. But look at this passage, Acts chapter 12. This is how bad it got in the first century church. Verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod Okay, prominent leader in Judea. He arrested some of some who belonged to the church. Intending to persecute them, he had James, the brother of John, put to death. The first apostle is assassinated by King Herod. And you stop and think about how, how does this affect the church? You know, one of our leaders has been killed. They're trying to stop us again. They tried to stop Jesus, but he resurrected from the dead, and, and they tried to, they killed Stephen. And now they're, now they're killing the apostles one by one. And it goes on when they killed him, when they killed James, when he when, when Herod saw that this met, was met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And it goes on to say in verse 5: So Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying for God to help him. And, and I wanted to read the rest of this because it's so, it's so powerful for us to hear. You know, when Peter was in jail, the church was praying. And look at how God answered the prayers. That night, before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chairs, with two chains. And sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He, was, he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. The angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your, clo- wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, and he had no idea that the angel was doing what he was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When he had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. When Peter came to to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's, Herod's clutches, from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. goes on to say that he went to John Mark's house, knocked on the door, and they didn't believe it was him at first. But finally they let him in, and Peter left the city safely that night. There's so many examples in the book of Acts of when the church is under threat, they got down on their knees and they prayed. And this wasn't the first time that Peter was arrested. Acts chapter 4, Peter was arrested. And he got out of prison and prayed. 
See, this is the weapon that we talked about a few weeks ago from our study of Ephesians 6. I believe the church needs to respond in a way that is, that is righteous and that is, is the way that Jesus would have us respond. See, the night before Jesus was going to be arrested, what was his response? Did he get on social media and say, hey guys, what they're doing to me and the way they're arresting me is totally unjust? What did Jesus do the night before he was arrested and crucified? We read that he got down on his knees and he, he prayed. And we're going to read some of that prayer in just a minute. But I want you to understand that the church of Jesus, after the first and second century, started to spread like wildfire. In fact, the Romans didn't know what to do with this new, as they called it, cult that was taking over the empire. And they had no army, they had no territory, and they had no political standing. Yet they were taking over the whole kingdom because of the way they treated each other, because of the influence that Jesus was having on the church versus the influence other people were having on them. And I want us to wrap up our study today just reminded of what what Jesus prayed that night and, and how Jesus went to the cross in humility. And when He was in the Garden of Olives that night before He went to the cross, John gives us a, a snapshot of His prayer, who He was praying for and what He was praying for. And guess who He was praying for and guess what He was praying for? My prayer is not for them alone. John 17, verse 20. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they be also in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I want you to imagine God and Jesus arguing over politics. Isn't that silly? Can you imagine that? But Jesus' heart for His church was that just as He and His Father were united in mind and heart, that we as brothers and sisters will be united. Stop and think about that. And if we're not united, and can I just be honest? Some of us are not. Some of us got strong issues. And you may feel justified. And that's between you and God. But let me tell you, if you are separating, you're pulling yourself back from the body of Christ, you've got to ask yourself the question, who and what are influencing you more? And I believe it's, it's so important for us to spend more time in the Scriptures and less time listening to all the pundits and their rhetoric about which side is right. You know, this is going to go on and it's going to change. And in 20 years, it's going to be different. But let me tell you, Jesus and His Word will stand strong for eternity. And I know this for me in the last 35 years. The more I allow Jesus to influence my life, the more my relationships get stronger. And the more I'm able to overcome temptation and sin and corruption in my own life. But the more that I let the world influence me, I start to get an edge with people and situations. And it's a reminder, wait a minute, who is affecting me and what is affecting me? And we can't let that happen in the church. We have to remain united and, you know, when you go back to Galatians chapter 6, and, and we're going we're gonna to wrap it up here with what Paul said, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Are you willing to listen to somebody who you disagree with? Are you willing to learn from somebody who you disagree with? Are you willing to lean in with somebody you disagree with? 
See, and I learned this very, very early on as a young Christian. You don't have to understand me or agree with me to love me. And I don't have to understand you, and I don't have to agree with you in order to love you. See, that's the beauty of the first and second and third century church. Guys, they were so, so different. Yet, they would come together on a Sunday morning before dawn and sing hymns to Jesus. The Romans couldn't understand it. It blew them away. They're like, I can't even believe these people. What are they about? What's this all about? And little by little, they took over the Roman Empire. So today, I want to encourage you to, to, to ask yourself the question, who's your greatest influence? And how is it affecting your mood? How's it affecting your relationships? How's it affecting the way you see your brothers and sisters and how you see even people in society? Are you yelling at the television? Are you, are you getting emotionally upset about political issues when really you're not really that concerned about your neighbor? Or you don't even know what's going on over at his house? He's lost and needs help? You know, we got to get our stories straight. You know, Jesus is not concerned about the, 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 you know, these, these things. He's concerned about, are you lost or are you saved? Are you in a relationship with my Father or not? That's why I came, to save you. And so today I really want to encourage all of us to put down our signs and pick up our Bibles and get ready for what's coming. And how do we get ready for what's coming? We do what the church in the first century did. We get down on our knees and and we pray, God, Whoever you want to be in power, we pray that your will be done, even though we don't like them, even though we don't agree with them, because we believe if we pray it, it's going to happen. That person is going to be there, maybe like Herod, to advance the gospel. See, because that's all that matters. How can we spread the gospel among all people, no matter their background, their race, their socioeconomic status, the language that they speak, that's what really matters. And let's remember the prayer of Jesus, that He wants us, you and me, to be as united as Him and His Father. I'm going to pray now for the communion. May God bless you, and I pray that this can be a time of reflection for you, to make some choices. And if you're not ready, maybe wait to take the communion. So you can get unified with your brothers and sisters. Pray with me now, if you would. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for the time that we have right now to remember Jesus. Thank you, God, that we have your written word. Thank you that we have the priorities of Jesus right in front of us. Father, forgive us for where we have allowed, you know, a a cognitive bias, a hypocrisy of how we view other people and judge them. And we don't use that same standard on ourselves. God, I pray that you will bring down those walls and help us today to move forward united. And God, that we can open our heart to the whole world and to the whole country, to our communities, even with people that we disagree with. God, we know that Jesus is most important and we want to follow him. Thank you right now. We remember his body. We remember his blood that were poured out for us. Help us, God, heal your church. Thank you we lift up this communion. Bless it, use it to to give us a brand new start. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. May God bless you in this coming week.